Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. Uh, this is the uh, ninth lecture in this course of international relations and we have so far had a terrific journey, uh, a very interesting journey in looking at uh, what IR is uh, from the time it began as an academic discipline in 1919 to uh, where we are right now. Uh, IR has opened up to be an um, area of exciting uh, conflicting, interesting issues ranging from uh, conservation of the environment to protecting uh, whales uh, to the International Red Cross to patriarchy to domestic work to everyday lives of consumption to the shoes that we wear to the uh, decisions that we make and finally uh, it raises questions about who controls uh, our lives. Uh, at a time where technology is bec has become extremely uh, pervasive and influential, uh, whether it is uh, the influence of uh, 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 bodies such as Facebook or whether it is uh, national governments, the critical question then is of the individual and the world. So IR allows us to uh, look at the multiple forms of engagement between uh, the individual, between the boundaries that he's uh, kept within or bounded by uh, international organizations, states and it is a very rich uh, complex uh, domain of academic inquiry. Now in the previous lecture we have looked at uh, IOs, international organizations and we have seen as to how IOs have multiplied in the 20th century uh, to a point that they now exercise a great degree of control uh, and influence in international politics. Uh, certain scholars view this positively and argue that uh, IOs are part of the globalization debate. Others are not so sure about the impact uh, these international organizations have, especially those which have a uh, influential reach in, to, in uh, finance, uh, where they influence migration and where they push uh, the gap between the global rich and the global poor. So we come to a crucial question in today's class and that is the question of globalization and globalization itself is positioned as a debate. Uh, the debate is centered upon the nature of this globalization, uh, the beneficiaries of this globalization, uh, the objective of this globalization and therefore it is quite legitimate to um, see a debate between uh, skeptics of globalization and proponents of globalization and in today's class we are going to be looking at, we are going to start off by looking at what do we mean by globalization and uh, who are the people who are supporting it and why and who are the people who are critical of it and why. So first things first, uh, the, the book that I am referring to is uh, David Hell's uh, classic text on globalization, uh, the Global Transformations and the title is indicative of globalizing being an ongoing process, uh, it is an ongoing process and David Held tells us that globalization can be, of course he is summarizing uh, people who have debated I have written about globalization so he is summarizing arguments and he argues that uh, one uh, globalization is fundamentally about action at a distance which means that things which are uh, at a very great distance can now be moved easily 
and the reference here is to uh, technology, the internet and as to how things can now move at a faster pace than ever before. So the first component is that of time and space compression where things, objects, people move at a far greater pace than ever before and naturally this is aided by technology. So time and space the compression of that, the spatial aspect of that is the first dimension. Uh, the second dimension is the geographical reach. So when we look at distance, uh, the world is shrinking or the world is getting smaller. Uh, about 700 years ago or perhaps even 400 years ago, uh, the world as we knew it was pretty much the village that we lived in or the town that we lived in that was the beginning an ending of our world but now the world has shrunk to a degree that uh, uh, progress in civil aviation and movement uh, has allowed people to view the world as a whole and therefore globalization is also at a conceptual level so when we talk about the geographical conceptual reach what what we mean is that people now view uh, the world as a connected, unified space where travel uh, and speed uh, accompany each other and can get, people, uh, get a person to one place to another and more importantly there is an accelerated sense of uh, time and space. Uh, the third dimension looks at the movement of goods. Uh, the movement of trade and uh, globalization is also uh, the economic aspect of it is the rapid pace at which uh, companies are able to now set up um, bases in other countries there is an international flow of money and finance uh, there are MNCs multinational companies which are able to have a global outreach. So uh, a scholar argues that there is McDonaldization of the world whereby uh, the number of McDonald's, uh, the American company which serves the trademark uh, burger, fries and coke are uh, indicative of the rapid invasion the rapid access granted to uh, cap American capitalist uh, companies, so whether it is Nike, whether it is Gap, whether it is several uh, these uh, la these big brands, uh, there is a global uh, feel to it. There is a global reach to it, uh, and uh, the fourth component, of course, is language. Uh, Hollywood and the English language are very much part of the globalizing process where a certain culture has a premium value compared to others and over here we look at uh, how English is the lingua franca of the world, uh, it is uh, the language of power as much as the language which one would use uh, to get around uh, in uh, uh, la, I mean in other parts of the world. So we've looked at globalization as a compression of distance and time, as a conceptual understanding of the world, as the access of uh, MNCs into foreign territories uh, and finally as an individual understanding of the world and over here we see that culture or uh, there is a global culture which is uh, based on the English language uh, uh, which is based on the use of technology whether it is uh, WhatsApp or Gmail and there is a certain global community which is utilizing these commonalities. Now so far globaliza globalization seems great but is there a dark uh, underpinning, is there a darkness underlying this, this optimism about the flow of goods, the transfer of technology, the 
flow of people, objects, what is the darker side and why is globalization the subject of such a heated uh, debate. Uh, so let's pause by looking at perhaps the darkest uh, instance of uh, the possibilities of globalization and of course I am not suggesting that this uh, sums up what globalization is but just to understand the inherent uh, inequalities upon which globalization is based. Now the instance that I am referring to is uh, often called the Bhopal gas tragedy and uh, this was uh, the world's uh, worst industrial accident which took place in 1984. Uh, the pesticide company uh, by the name of the Union Carbide Limited had set up uh, a company in Bhopal and uh, on the night of 3rd December 1984 there was a massive leak of uh, methyl isocyanate uh, leading to uh, the tragic death of uh, thousands of people. Now the question is not of the industrial accident but the uh, question is that of the responsibility and the consequences of an American company which was later acquired by Dow uh, setting up base in a third world country uh, causing an accident and the consequences of that. Uh, after the accident Union Carbide pulled out and um, the administration of that company fled to America which ensued in a long legal battle. But eventually after it was acquired by Dow, the compensation given uh, to the victims and survivors of the Bhopal gas tragedy was uh, amounted to a meaningless sum, especially after the many years and the long battle, uh, the long legal battle. So the question which arises is, uh, who are the beneficiaries of globalization? Uh, is globalization a new process, is, is there something new about it? Is globalization another form of uh, westernization? Uh, Let us not forget that in the 1960s, uh, Nakuruma of uh, Ghana qualified this as neo-colonialism at just at the start of the setting up of the Bretton Woods institutions. So when we look at globalization and uh, examine it as a global transformation and we look at the emergence of global cities as Saskia Sassen who is a well-known uh, writer on globalization would tell us that uh, globalization is positioned upon uh, transformations of time and space uh, but at the same time it is it builds upon uh, certain uh, global hierarchies between white and brown on the basis of race, uh, on the basis of gender between men and women, on the basis of location uh, between uh, the western world and the developing country. So globalization is a transformation, is a global transformation uh, which is positioned upon existing hierarchies of race, gender, uh, and geography and in order to understand globalization better it is therefore necessary to look into the historical antecedents of globalization to see what is globalization, what is globalism and what is new about uh, globalization. So, so we are going to start by looking at uh, an article by Jan Ann Skolte and this article is called uh, what is global about globalization is it really something new is the question that he is asking and Skolte argues that there isn't anything new about it because it has a long historical precedence to it so when we say that the world is coming together uh, we do know that uh, for uh, thousands of years human civilizations have reached out to each other and there have been global networks of trade, uh, of knowledge, uh, of culture 
and what we see as globalization is a part of that very long uh, process over hundreds of years of people learning from each other. So just to give a small uh, short historical narrative of globalization, uh, the birth of Christianity, the birth of Islam uh, in the 8th century, um, the crusades in the 12th and the 13th century between Islam and Christianity, uh, the conquering of Constantinople by uh, the Muslims and the conversion of Constantinople into Istanbul, uh, the spread of Mughal, uh, of Islamic empires, whether it's the Ottoman Empire uh, in what is now present-day Turkey, uh, the Mughal Empire in um, uh, South Asia, uh, obviously challenged uh, the Christian hegemony till that point of time and also aided the spread of religions and cultures beyond boundaries. So if you look at globalization as a spread of people and the interconnection of people, this is a process which has uh, been ongoing and we come, we've come now to the 16th century to the Mughal Empire. Uh, in 1707 we know that Aurangzeb dies uh, and it is also around this time that we see that European imperialism uh, begins as a, has a global outlook and it is Western Europe <coughs> uh, imperial tendencies which uh, stem into the acquisition of South Asian, African and American colonies by Western European states such as Portugal, Spain, France, uh, Italy, Germany being the last and of course we know uh, the Dutch empires, the Portuguese empires were one of the earliest and followed by uh, the British empire. Now how is this related to globalization? Uh, colonialism and colonization were that process which forcibly built, uh, pulled the world in together in the form of empires. And this history of imperialism is extremely important when we look at uh, globalization which is positioned as a neutral process. But what I'm trying to draw your attention to is that global transformations often carry with them the ideologies and ideas of the powerful and globalization therefore must not be seen as a neutral process but in every epoch uh, global transformations have been brought about by imperial powers uh, and imperialism is perhaps the uh, that structure which aids the fastest spread of people ideas and technology and colonialism does just that uh, in the 16th to the 20th century. So American imperialism in uh, Cuba and Philippines, uh, we've looked at the Spanish empires, the Portuguese empires, were empires which spread the European languages, uh, European uh, technologies and most importantly, as uh, Anthony Giddens would tell us, uh, modernity modernity as that ideal, uh, as that idea of uh, the rational mind uh, conquering uh, nature, modernity as that uh, scientific uh, outlook and uh, modernity as that belief in the ability of the human to control or uh, to dominate and of course all of this is linked to the 16th century uh, enlightenment project of uh, the celebration of science and uh, those of you interested can look up Francis Bacon as a person who celebrated and upheld the value neutral uh, project of science. So what we can see so far is globalization is linked to a history of power and domination and the process of pulling the world together 
uh, has been brought about forcibly by the forces of colonization and colonization is uh, has been responsible to the fact that we I am now speaking in English is uh, irredeemably linked to India having been a former British colony. So when we look at globalization, uh, we must look at it with a view of historicizing it, which is what Rostenberg tell, tells us, but also contextualizing it in the present period. Now, uh, if colonialism was the unabashed domination and control of one power over another, the term globalization doesn't certainly carry that uh, value uh, ladenness of colonialism. So, but what is globalization and what is the economic aspect of that and why do uh, critics of globalization point out its underlying ideological uh, domain? For that we need to look at the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, which is something that we have been centering upon right from the start and uh, look at the nature of economic globalization upon which uh, every other globalization rests. So when we look at globalization, if we look at, look at it as the coming together of or the invisibilizing or the fuzzing borders of nation states. The first principle of that is economics, the flow of goods and people, whether it's trade or migration. And for that, we must uh, pause and look at the Bretton Woods institutions and to see uh, the havoc and the changes that these institutions have brought about uh, in the name of development. And uh, we will give it, we will give it the. Uh, uh, the benefit of uh, being well-meaning institutions in our evaluation of the Bretton Woods. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Bretton Woods institutions and see the link between globalization and uh, economic flows and financial flows and these institutions which have aided this economic uh, globalization. In our examination of globalization, therefore, what is truly striking are the diverse sets of opinions on the phenomena itself. Uh, so as we have been seeing, uh, globalization is intrinsically linked to the process of colonialism. Uh, colonization allowed uh, uh, certain col colonizer states to benefit from uh, the process and by the end of the decolonization uh, process um, there was a distinctly uh, there was a distinction between north and south um, in global politics where the north are categorized as first world uh, wealthy states and uh, the south states are uh, developing uh, undemocratic uh, marked by poverty and unemployment the basic point here is that when we look at the onset of globalization, it began on existing hierarchies, uh, inequalities and injustices and it is here that globalization's design, the way, the manner in which it is pitted as being neutral and natural uh, is what needs to be questioned. Uh, so just to run over that again, uh, globalization unlike uh, colonization is positioned as a process which is flowing quite naturally, uh, very much like a gentle stream and is benefiting people around the world. Uh, however, uh, scholars of IR uh, incisively question the naturalness, um, the, uh, the gentle flow to globalization and question the very neutrality of it. So before looking into the underlying forces which have compelled globalization, I'm going to be looking at two scholars who view it very differently and then we will proceed to see what the bone of contention is, the heart of the matter 
and that of course are the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, the first uh, scholar we are looking at is uh, Joseph Nye, uh, who we have met before when we have looked at liberalism. Joseph Nye also championed the concept of soft power. But right now we are more interested in looking uh, at his uh, observations about globalization. And Nye positions globalization as a form of American domination. Nye is an American himself and he argues that America won the Cold War uh, precisely because it embedded liberalism in institutions and structures which facilitated the growth of American capitalism, allowed American companies to spread far and wide, allowed American capitalism, technology, people, ideas to buttress uh, the American, uh, American domination in global politics. A uh, nice equation of globalization with American power is a nod to the success, if you could call it that, to the Bretton Woods institutions. And what I mean by that is the fact that uh, nearly all sovereign states, uh, perhaps barring North Korea, are members of these extremely uh, influential uh, financial institutions and we will be seeing how they are influential and in what manner they question the very nature of the sovereign state. So uh, Nye's argument uh, unravels and reveals uh, the clear uh, equation between globalization and Americanization and therefore when there are questions about globalization being a form of American power, they are of course fairly accurate. But of course, Nye uh, upholds it as a triumph of uh, liberalism, of liberal institutionalism. And we have a completely different set of ideas from uh, Negri and Hart, uh, Antonio Negri and Michael Hart, who are scholars who view globalization as empire, empire with a capital E. And to uh, quote their, uh, to quote them, the starting sentence of their essay on this is, uh, "Empire is materializing before our very eyes." Now, the description of globalization as empire again reminds us as to how production and labor are is at the core of the of understanding any society and any. Uh, international uh, economy, uh, any set of ex uh, uh, market and uh, exchange systems. But Negri and Hart are telling us that this is an empire, but this is an empire not like the ones we have seen in the past. So we have seen um, the uh, British Empire, the um, French Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Portuguese Empire. And Negri and Ha tell us that even though these empires were ruthless, uh, appropriative, exploitative, uh, domineering and dominating, they existed on a certain territorialization, which meant that there was a clear understanding of the center, of the heart of control, and the colony which was controlled and uh, leached off. But uh, they tell us that the American empire, which is of what we call globalization, is different. And it is different because the linkages of power are invisible in a world where we do not see the source of power. Instead, it is amorphous. It exists, but we do not uh, see it in the same ruthless way in which colonialism exercised its power. In effect, uh, Negri and Hart are telling us that globalization uh, is far more insidious than colonialism because the structures of power are invisible and instead it is couched in terms of uh, the sovereign state, uh, acceptance of terms and conditions and uh, volition and a uh, mutual uh, dependency system. In short, globalization is positioned as a neutral 
value system when in effect it is a form of domination and control and that is precisely what makes it harder to resist. So while colonization could be contested ideologically, uh, militarily, um, conceptually, uh, globalization is harder to resist because, because there is no site identifiable site of power to contest it. So what we can see is that there is a certain general understanding and recognition that perhaps globalization is not uh, natural or neutral, but this becomes uh, most evident when we look at the forces behind uh, globalization in the 20th century and of course those are the Bretton Woods institutions. So what we have seen so far is that uh, we have looked at multiple ways of looking at globalization. Uh, David Held would say that it is the compression of time and space, uh, there is a spatial dimension to it, conceptually it is the rapid movement, the accelerated space of the flow of goods and objects, ideas and people. Uh, on the other hand, we also have a starker view of it in the opinion of Negri and Hart who identify it as another kind of an empire, but as an empire that we have never witnessed before. Again, Joseph Nye tells us that the American uh, success of the Cold War lay in its ability to set up financial institutions and that was a form, that is a form of American hegemony. So in effect, what we can see is that economic control is a uh, the source of America's power, its superpower uh, nature and it explains why America survived the Cold War, why the Soviet Union collapsed and most importantly uh, the continuing hegemony of American capitalism. So a wide number of uh, Marxist scholars have contested this and you can have a look at um, David Harvey, uh, Leo Panitch uh, and a whole range of Marxist scholars who have outlined uh, the capitalistic nature of uh, the, the uh, international political economy. Uh, but this will become a little clearer when we look at the Bretton Woods institutions. So the year is 1944. And uh, there is a extremely influential uh, economist by the name of John Maynard Keynes. Uh, his theory of economics is, Keen is often called Keynesianism or Keynesian uh, economics. And fundamentally, uh, Keynes, who was a British economist who studied at Cambridge, uh, influenced considerably the, the, what went into the making of the Bretton Woods institutions. Now let's remind ourselves of what these institutions are. Uh, these are being set up even while the war is going on, so the years 1944. The war has not ended and a set of 44 nations uh, assemble in order to decide the financial architecture of the future. And it is here that Keynes is at his arrogant best, uh, perhaps 22 of those 44 nations uh, did not speak English, uh, did not know uh, the consequences of those actions and nonetheless it is at this time that agreements are signed which allow, uh, which pave the way for the emergence of these uh, institutions. Uh, Keynes very famously describes this as a monkey madhouse or a, mad, uh, a madhouse full of monkeys indicating that perhaps the members of uh, the, the members of the uh, Bretton Woods um, conference were not aware but nonetheless it is at this time that certain ideas of Keynes are taking place and we will look at those uh, closely now. Um, 
these ideas are also called uh, the Washington Consensus and that is a term very frequently used when we look at the WTO and the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, now, these three uh, institutes were set up as institutes which would restructure the international financial architecture. But the question is how? How were they going to do that? The IMF and the World Bank were designed to be uh, lenders uh, of money to poor developing uh, countries. So, they were designed to provide financial stability uh, to uh, countries who were recently decolonized. But it is here that this money which was being offered came with a certain condition and this is often called like I said the Washington Consensus. Uh, it is also often called uh, SAPs that is Structural Adjustment Program. But fundamentally borrowing money from the World Bank came upon uh, on the basis of certain conditions. Uh, the first condition of a borrower state would be to uh, lower uh, tariff barriers in order to aid uh, the free flow of trade, which means that a state would not be allowed to be protectionist and protect its economy. Instead, they would they were encouraged to uh, reduce their tariff barriers. The second bit was to reduce public expenditure public expenditure in hospitals, uh, schools, uh, for education, in healthcare. It meant rolling back the state. Now, the term rolling back the state means that the state would step back from uh, domains which are considered to be of public concern. And of course, we mean health and education here, infrastructure, things which are the rights of the citizens. And when the state rollbacks comes the third element of allowing uh, the free competition between private players in the domestic arena. Now, this is called uh, liberalization. Uh, it is a form of the state abdicating from its fundamental uh, roles of public welfare. But these were conditions upon which uh, the World Bank and the IMF lent money, which often which also meant that borrowing states were more inclined to borrow money to fix issues, and in exchange they would often end up uh, accepting these uh, changes, which would only make their conditions worse. So, the World Bank's slogan is that its dream is to end poverty. Uh, similarly, the IMF is committed to financial uh, stability. But following the decades of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, the World Bank began to uh, come under tremendous criticism for its uh, projects which were funded thoughtlessly with little regard for the people who were involved in it. Uh, two examples uh, which I could give right now. Uh, the first is the, the Poloro Center project in Brazil, which was a 1500 kilometer long uh, highway to be constructed uh, in Brazil, which was to connect highly populated spaces with the Amazon forest. And as the years progressed, it became increasingly clear that this project has not been well thought out. And as, the, uh, as time passed, uh, it became very evident that far from achieving its end of employment, it had actually increased poverty levels and there was a big breakout of malaria. And uh, the World Bank uh, rationale to fund such a project came under severe criticism. Uh, similarly, the Narmada, uh, making the Narmada Dam in the Narmada Valley was, was a project which began in uh, 1985. It was a project which had, which devoted little thought to the people who were, the 4,000 people to be displaced at the time of the project. There was little uh, understanding of the number of people to be, who would be affected the forests which, which would be ruined by the uh, dam 
and the social and the ecological costs of this project. Nonetheless, the World Bank persisted in funding projects ostensibly for social and uh, uh, economic welfare and progress with little regard for the human impact. And ironically enough, uh, data revealed that far from eradicating poverty, states which had taken loans uh, from the World Bank and IMF were actually uh, poorer than what they were when they took the loan. Now these uh, uh, inputs point to the fact as to how uh, privatization and the inroad of private companies were detrimental to the growth of these developing economies and as to how privatization aided uh, the penetration of these markets and allowed for greater profits for America but fewer profits and fewer welfare benefits for poor countries. Secondly, uh, wherever there was a large of, uh, transfer of fund, uh, charges of corruption often came up and in effect by the late 1990s it was found that severe charges of malnutrition, poverty, unemployment, uh, degradation uh, were rampant uh, among states which had been beneficiaries of this which only made it clear that far from eradicating malnutrition, poverty, unemployment, uh, the World Bank was actively achieving them. It is also here that we see that uh, global, within globalization, uh, the state has been pushed to recede. So the word recede means to withdraw and it is here that we also see the widespread, uh, uh, the AIDS and the HIV epidemic which uh, was first identified in uh, Africa and then spread rapidly was on account of the limited public expenditure on primary healthcare, primary education and primary infrastructure. So what this tells us is that globalization is a process which has been pushed and hoisted upon the world with a clear economic agenda and that economic agenda favors capitalist countries such as America and this is a form of American hegemony where the World Bank and the IMF and uh, the WTO in seemingly neutral ways, in seemingly uh, polite civil ways, uh, enmesh and engage uh, states within the, uh, the, the net of the international political economy. Uh, as uh, the United Nations uh, Millennium Goals were being evaluated, it was found that social indicators of life had progressively deteriorated in developing countries and the indexes of the quality of life had considerably weakened. So questions of education, healthcare, employment were considerably worse from where they were 50 years ago, again pointing to the cleavages made by globalization. So what we can see essentially is that globalization is a process which is fundamentally economical, uh, economical and uh, based on economic sorry and it is one which uh, widens the uh, social uh, and material inequalities between the north and the south. But where the IMF and the World Bank were institutions which began functioning in 1944, it is the third institution, the World Trade Organization, also known uh, as its predecessor GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, that truly highlights the sharp differences between the developing and the developed world in the 
uh, argument on globalization. So, we are going to shift our focus to uh, GATT which was uh, signed in 1947 as an agreement, it was a piece of paper and between 1947 and 1995 there were over 7 rounds of meetings, uh, negotiations and discussions about the shape of this organization which was to facilitate trade. So, the Bretton Woods institutions are institutions which organize financial architecture. The IMF was imagined to be a fund to regulate stability. The World Bank was imagined to be a bank to help uh, states uh, in their post-war reconstruction. And the GATT was imagined to be the organization to facilitate free and fair trade. Unlike the first two, the GATT took the longest time to gain a consensus, uh, almost 50 years and it is the last round which began uh, in uh, 1989 and went up to uh, 1994, sorry 1984 to 1990, uh, uh, 1986 to 1994 that uh, highlighted the uh, cost of uh, trade between developed and developing countries. When it was formed uh, in 1995, the World Trade Organization represented the most comprehensive organization to facilitate trade. Uh, when the GATT was envisaged, it was en envisaged as an organization to link trade, but by the time the Uruguay round, which took place between 86 and 94 was complete. Uh, there were three new elements which were part of WTO. So, the WTO is this mammoth gigantic organization which aids free trade, but again the question arises uh, free means uh, what does free trade mean when uh, the world that we are negotiating in is already uh, uh, marked by inequality and divided across uh, along uh, race, gender and uh, location. So, in 1995 when the WTO finally comes into shape, it is a formally an international organization with the real headquarters in Rapad in Switzerland and it has uh, amongst other things also included three areas which were not originally in it and that is uh, GATS, General Agreement on Trade in Services, uh, TRIPS, which is uh, the Agreement on Intellectual uh, uh, Property Rights and the third is TRIMS, which is Trade Related uh, Investment Measures. Now, these three areas are essentially contentious because when we talk about trade in services, uh, services could be of individuals as well as the people who are providing the services which in effect means migration. Uh, now while we are looking at these, uh, these three set of contentious issues, one finds that there are stark differences between what is to be achieved from developing countries and what developed countries uh, hope to achieve and under GATT uh, a fundamental principle which was established was the principle of consensus which means that even if one state disagrees uh, uh, a consensus would not be taken and this is often called the MFN the most favored nation which fundamentally means that each state has a right to veto. And that also explains as to why the, uh, uh, the negotiations over WTO took such a long time because it meant having everybody on board uh, while the IMF and the World Bank have weighted voting which means that voting takes place uh, on the basis of um, the amount of funds you have deposited in the funds which means that the wealthiest states have the most have the greatest weightage of votes 
or the world or the WTO functions on one vote per state. So, as a consequence, the WTO as we see today has covers several areas which uh, were not originally designed to be in the GATT and these are widespread uh, which they include services, intellectual property rights or uh, trade related investment measures which only means that uh, a great number of uh, trade is going to take place on areas where developing countries are already on uh, uh, on the I have got the shorter end of the stick. Two issues which are of crucial importance for agriculture and textiles but a lot of this uh, requires uh, looking into the history of the WTO at closer um, detail and there are a few books that would help you out in that. The first is uh, Amrita Narlikar's uh, observations about developing countries within the WTO and of course a wonderful book which will give you a rich overview of uh, the Bretton Woods institutions is the book by Richard Peat uh, called The Unholy Trinity and both of these allow, you, allow one to see the economic aspect, the financial uh, design of the world that we inhabit. So, taking a broad survey of where we have gotten so far, one can see as to how uh, globalization is a disputed area precisely because uh, there is a certain design, uh, there is a certain intention and there is a certain manifestation to the nature of globalization. So, we can list out a number of things, a uh, number of observations about globalization. Uh, the first thing that globalization uh, is of, uh, is, a mul is an area with multiple dimensions including language, culture, uh, society, uh, uh, politics as well as economics. Uh, this lecture has focused more on the economic aspect uh, of globalization, but of course globalization uh, indicates the current uh, most the powerful state, the most powerful state in the system and that of course is uh, America. The language that we speak, the food that we eat is increasingly Americanized and of course one sees this more concretely after the first world war, uh, after the end of the cold war. So, what we see is that globalization is certainly not a neutral process. There is a certain uh, economic aspect to it and that is exactly why it is a hotly contested uh, space. So, while you have the critics of globalization such as Negri and Hart um, amongst others David Harvey, you also have defenders of globalization and the book that comes to mind is Jagdish Bhagwati's uh, In Defense of Globalization which looks into the material uh, transformations brought about by a globalization. But when we sum up our uh, examination of globalization, it does reveal that there are material inequalities which have only been heightened by globalization. When one looks at the material, uh, uh, when one looks at the material ideational control, we see that there is a gender disparity, which means that the, I, the three institutions we have been mentioning have been dominated by men. Nearly 89% uh, of these bureaucratic structures are designed and controlled by men, which also means that half the world's population is not adequately uh, thought of or considered in these economic making structures. The third and the most vital area which globalization draws our attention to is the relationship between globalization and the nation state and the state. As we have seen the Washington consensus is a corrosive force on the nation's sovereignty which means that the nation's control over its infrastructure, its public expenditure is being persuasively pushed back. 
At the same time, one sees that the state is negotiating, uh, cooperating, uh, also being transformed uh, in its uh, parley, in its negotiations with other international uh, organizations. And therefore, one wonders, uh, for instance, there's an influential scholar, Kenichi Omaha, who argues that we are now reaching a borderless world. But when we celebrate a borderless world, we also must question about the ability of people to move in those borderless worlds. Are we only talking about people who then have a passport, who have the ability to move across spaces with sophistication and ease. And as Rustam Barucha reminds us that in the talk of borderlessness and globalization, there are some who are privileged enough to move seamlessly from one space to another. And at the same time, globalization disables, disempowers some uh, groups of people from doing the same and of course who, who I have in mind are uh, uh, women, uh, lower paid uh, migrants, uh, blue collar workers, manual workers who often find globalization to be a nameless force, a force beyond their reach, uh, an invisible force which shapes their lives, controls them in a manner in which they cannot respond to. Uh, so we end today's lecture by looking at globalization with a question mark uh, about its future, about its contestations, about our complicity, about the state's complicity in it. And of course, that le leads us to the last uh, lecture of this course, which is the nation state itself. How has globalization transformed the essential unit of the state, as we look at international politics today, what is the relationship between states and IOs and other private forces like MNCs, uh, technology and data? These are pressing questions which invite us to delve deeper, uh, swim um, harder against the tide in order to examine uh, questions which impact our everyday lives and more importantly, our future. Uh, with that, I end today's class and in the next class, we will be looking at uh, the state, the formation of the state and where the state is heading to in this globalizing and allegedly uh, borderless world. Uh, thank you.